welcome to another program on the slate. I'm Elise Roth. I'm a senior editor here at Backstage. And today, very exciting, we are joined by Sherry Thomas and Russell Scott of the Ali Thomas Casting. Um, we're going to talk a lot about their recent work. They'll give us some advice. Um, if you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you put questions into the chat, I won't see them. So please use the Q&A function. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, some people have already sent in some great questions so far. So we will get into it. Um, Sherry and Russell are double nominated for Emmys this year um, for their work on Dead to Me, which we'll talk a little bit about today and for The Handmaid's Tale, but they've also been nominated for their work on HBO's Barry and Breaking Bad. And they, I mean, some of your favorite TV shows, they're, they're behind them. So um, we'll kind of cover a little bit of all of that today while also getting some advice from them, answering your questions. Um, but first, London. Yeah, there's people will right. probably be tuning in from That's a, crazy. Lot of, a lot of places because Yay. I'm trying to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Um, all right, so I think some people are still coming in, but we can get started. Um, and we'll start kind of from the beginning. We're here to talk about Dead to Me and talk about how you got attached to the show. You know, we just saw season two, that's what's nominated, but yeah. how you get connected in the first place. Um, well, the process for us actually getting attached to a job comes, um, in one of two ways typically, which is we have a relationship established already with the creator um, or the showrunner. Um, and in this case, we did not, but we did have a relationship, um, a very strong relationship with the studio who called and they say, hey, you know, we've got this new uh, show that's coming up. We think you guys might be a good fit. Do you wanna take a look at it and, and um, engage? So we did, we read the script and um, Russell and I just felt that it was very fresh and interesting. We also uh, were very excited about the idea of working with Liz um, and, um, you know, uh, Jessica Albom. So um, we set a meeting and we go in and we basically have to audition, you know, like an actor and come in prepared with um, an aesthetic, an idea. Um, fortunately, most people have a sense of our work, so they're they're happy to have us there as we're happy to be there. And we, you know, we just kind of do a lot of preparing and homework and we go in and we just, you know, go in and, and get the job as if it's our first job or try to get the job. And, you know, fortunately on this, we were invited to the party, so. We booked it. We booked it. Yeah, I always think it's interesting to hear that. I don't think actors always realize that sometimes it's kind of like a mirror process for your side of things. Too. Yeah. You have to prepare and you have to show that you understand the job and then and convince the creators of the show that you can do the job. Yeah. And I think too, sometimes that um, even when we have an established relationship, there are times where, uh, you know, a new entity is coming into play. And so it is only respectful to have the new entity be able to have a decision in the, in, in the process. So sometimes even when we have a very longstanding relationship with somebody, we have to then, um, you know, kind of do a little bit of a meet and greet, if you will, because you're working so closely with these people. You kind of want to like them and their energy. So. Yeah. And when it comes to the chance to work with, with a creator or a showrunner that you've worked with before, how how does that affect your process and the way you do your job when you kind of have a shorthand of sorts because you've done the process before with them? Mm -hmm. Russell? Um, he has a voice. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the, um, you know, we've worked with the Better Call Saul Breaking Bad crew for, God, how long has it been? Over 10 years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think after, uh, after you've worked with people for a while and they get to know kind of your taste and you get to know their taste, there's definitely a shorthand to it where you, um, kind of 
know what sorts of actors they're going to respond to and what sort of yeah. performance they're looking to in the tapes because so much even before COVID so much of our casting um, was done uh, via tape and even like when we have actors come into the room to audition for example on Better Call Saul the producers watch all of those tapes they're never in mm -hmm. the room with the actors so it's a lot about us shaping the performance um, in the room to kind of what we know they're going to respond to and look for, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be challenging. Uh, yeah. Now that we can't be in the room with anyone, but we'll, you yeah. know, we're figuring out ways to make that work with technology. Yeah. I also think too um, is, you know, when you're working with new people, you really, um, it's kind of like, you're starting all over again and we want them to we want to show them how we know how to do a good job and so you know I, I feel like we always approach it as if it's our first job and it keeps us hungry and it keeps us very passionate and um you're introducing them to systems that have been in place for a really long time but we're also very open to them if they find something that is or isn't working that they would like to implement we're very open to that you know the relationship between the creators the directors and the casting directors are very collaborative so you know that's just sort of the logistical labor side of it and you know just to add on to what russell said about the creative so the message is actors in an audition room or when you're getting instructions for a uh, self-tape listen to your casting directors trust what they're yes. saying because they're channeling what is coming from the creators or you know in one way or the other whether it's from mm -hmm. a relationship or meetings that you've had yeah and i think that we have always you know um cast from around the world so we have always sent out very specific instructions um and we have also always said too if there's something that isn't making sense within the context you know reach out to us directly and we can help because sometimes they are doing it in a vacuum and sometimes they're doing it with fake material, you know, um, because a lot of shows now are, are you know, hidden in such secrecy with, with storyline. Um, so we always prefer being in a room with an actor, but if there's somebody we're interested in who can't do that, we want to engage as if we were being in the room with them because that's our job. Yeah, um, I do wanna get, sorry, Russell, were you saying something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, it is really important to be open to um, direction and things when you come in the room. Um, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes an actor will come in and they're really married to what they prepared and their idea, and they just don't want to move off of that, and that's a big red flag. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I do want to get into a little bit of self-taste specifics later, but I am also curious, especially because we're talking about season two of a show that, you know, was successful and people were excited for it to come back. We saw a lot of familiar faces, whether they were playing the same characters or a slightly different character. Um, so what is that process? How is that process different? Obviously, you're not filling a whole cast. So what is it like to return to a show that you've already cast the, season, the first season or previous seasons and now you're adding to this familiar group of people that people have kind of grown to love in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. Sherry. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that, um, I think that it, the, the bar has been set. And, you know, in season one, the bar had been set with Christina and Linda who are, you know, First of all, they were so um, connected in a um, chemical way. Their chemistry was just like, you know, off the charts. But their nuance performances while being funny, I mean, there is no, in my opinion, um, there's no end to what they can do. And so the bar has been set. And so even in those very tiny one line parts, you've got to make sure that these people can really be grounded and authentic and cemented when they're playing opposite and you know any of our leads for that matter so 
um, you, you, you build upon that. And sometimes season two is more challenging because we, as casting directors, challenge ourselves. And so we never sit back on anything. We've got to, um, you know, who are we going to introduce to them this year that they didn't necessarily know last year um, in terms of the actors? And Liz Feldman knows every comedic actor on the planet. So it's really hard to find people that she doesn't know. And every once in a while we get in there and we do it. So that's exciting. Um, and I think the approach is always to, to um, cast as if they could come back in a very meaningful, significant way. Um, for example, season one, you know, um, Erica Kreutz, we didn't know what that was going to be or that she would be coming back or um, Shandy for that. Yes. 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 Little, little girl, little Shandy. Yes, little Shandy. And, you know, they were brought back because they were so good and they wanted to write to them a little bit more. They realized, you know, what, what that brought to the table. Um, but in terms of Natalie Morales, Russell, I'll let you speak to that uh, because that was a really, that was the first big significant role that we were, you know, assigned to, to bring in, right? Yes. Um, and Natalie Morales uh, was someone that came up early in the conversations and we mm -hmm. all loved that idea and Liz loved that idea, but she really wasn't available. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, that's, that's just another thing about our job is you kind of have to dig in sometimes and, if, and, be like, well, if it's somebody that's really, that you really want, that's really gonna pop and um, uh, perfect for the role, you, you want to try to figure out a way to make it work. And um, she was shooting a movie that was also shooting in LA where Dead to Me shoots. And um, after we went through the whole process and saw people and everything, um, she was still kind of at the top of the list. And um, we went back to the producer and was like, is there any way, like, can we, here's her movie dates. And um, they actually ended up moving the schedule a little bit, um, mm -hmm. the, hi the hiatus period and stuff to kind of work it out for her. And um, uh, we were very happy about that. Cause- Russell's very good at making friends with our line producer so that <laughs> if we need anything to happen, he, he can make it happen. And it takes hours sometimes to, you know, finagle that and manipulate that, but um, she's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's another aspect that people don't realize because they see you in an audition room or in yeah. that kind of context. And it's like, well, behind the scenes, you're, you're not just trying to find the best actor for the role. You're also trying to do some wizardry when it comes to scheduling and making sure everyone's in the same place at the same time. It's yeah. kind of like casting director slash producer because there are days where, you know, it, people think it's a very glamorous job and you just read with great actors all day long and audition them and talk to, you know, producers and directors and then that's it. There are like days where we're, you know, on the ground um, going through books, trying to research, figure out, or, you know, on one of our shows, there was 32 pages of a day out of days and you're highlighting to make sure that you're not missing hiring anybody. And when days get changed, you got to do it all over again. It's, you know, you're really um, producing sometimes in a way. It's a lot of managing and producing and communicating with a lot mm -hmm. of people. Um, in addition in to the creative work, it's a yeah. lot of not creative work. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting to hear, I think that I would assume when you're casting a second season of something and you already have the core cast in place that it might be easier because you're not, you know, you don't have all these roles to fill, but you just said it's a challenge because you're trying to, you know, match or exceed, you know, what the work you did the previous season. And I guess I can understand how it's like you're you're building, there was a puzzle that you already made and now you have to like add on to this puzzle um, in a way that's, you can't do chemistry reads with everyone just to make sure that no. they fit, so. No. It's interesting to hear. Um, yeah, I was gonna say something and then obviously my phone rang and distracted me and I can't remember what it was I was gonna say. Well, uh, but it was about season two and it was, I don't know, it was probably really interesting. <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> Well, uh, one good thing about this show um, in season two is that um, 
everyone had seen season one and loved it. So then like everybody wants to do the show. That's what I was gonna say. I knew it. Everybody you are like connected yes everybody's aware so you don't have to explain what it is everybody knows what it is and then people are like oh i want to do that show okay so that's like it's that's both makes it easier and it's kind of a challenge because then there's you probably have too many people who are interested for the amount of roles available well yeah and i don't know russell there are people who are you know there are amazing very um, seasoned, seasoned actors have, who have bodies of work like, you know, longer than our bodies. So I don't want to call anybody out, but did Steve's mom that we cast ever see the show? I don't know. There might have had she to have been a little bit. Did she? I wonder if she ever saw season one. Oh, yeah. Frances Conroy? Yeah. yeah. Did she watch season one? Yeah. I, okay. believe, I believe her agent told me that she loved the show. Was a fan. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, that was, I mean, the dreams of Katie Segal, Francis Conroy, I, I, it's just like, it's, it's amazing because I don't think there are a lot of shows out there that really highlight women in that age group. And so to be able to do that in season one and season two, it's, it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. And so you had, you had said a little bit earlier, especially on this show, you're looking for comedic actors and you try to find people who maybe Liz didn't know about when you are trying when you're doing that kind of search and you are really trying to dig deep where do you look besides you know the obvious people you reach out to agents but when you're trying to find a fresh face where do you look um we do a lot of general we tend to do a lot of generals and try to eat eat no meat interesting um, I like to eat so yeah <laughs> actors um, throughout the year so um, who you know are just signing with an agent or something or who are visiting from New York or whatever um, and also um, our associate on the show Alyssa Morris is amazing um, she and we go to the groundlings we go to all of the the places in LA that we should be going to comedically but I also think we don't we don't stay in that lane we are kind of um, I don't want to say known for, but we get inspired by trying to switch lanes, like trying to get somebody that's only known for one thing and switch them into the comedic lane and show another side of them because a really good actor honestly can do both. Not everybody can do everything, but there are some that really have the craft that without pushing too hard one way or the other can, can do that. Yeah, well, we saw that on... Breaking Bad with Brian Cranston. I think people, a lot of people yeah. are very surprised to see. That. And Bob Odenkirk and... Yeah, and, and Bill Burr. Burr. I Chris mean, Burr all of those. Like comedy I, yeah, all of them. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, do you have like a... I'm, I'm, when, you're, when you're casting a comedy versus casting something that's a little bit more dramatic, do you, are there noticeable differences? Or like you said, you just kind of you, you know, try to make people switch lanes so you're not looking for something specific for either? Well, for me personally, I think it's, um, and not for Dead to Me, but more in the Barry zone, um, it's really about somebody who's compelling. And even, you know, even for Danny McBride shows that um, we do, Vice Principals and now um, Righteous Gemstones, it's, you have to be able to have his rhythm and go with that rhythm but it's also okay to have your own rhythm. Um, but at the end of the day, what I've discovered is you've got to be compelling, no matter what, because that's what gives a character depth. So when you can find somebody that can do that, it's, um, you know, that's what makes it worth watching in a way. Um, Tony Cavallero was a perfect example who was cast in Righteous Gemstones. He kind of came in and just did something that nobody else was doing um for his character and it just worked and now they can write to that and then he also knows how to implement that into the danny mcbride world you know yeah i think it's it's can be encouraging to know that even if someone has done a lot of dramatic work or a lot of comedic work that there there can be an opportunity that casting directors can identify that there is more to them than just the work that's on their resume mm -hmm. and they can um successfully transition i guess to yeah that 
happening more nowadays. And that used to happen to us too. We couldn't get a comedy forever because <laughs> we were known yeah. for drama. Um, couldn't even get in the room to audition. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, what's the old saying? Um, uh, try and try again? <laughs> no, not that one. Um, dying is easy, comedy is hard. Um, something like that. I do think um, in general. Jason says it a little different. <laughs> In general, I think it's easier for um, actors who can do comedy can more usually do drama than the reverse because you can be a dramatic actor and you're just not funny. Yeah. 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 But the beauty of what we do is we get to try. So we are always willing to, you know, give that a try. Um, I think what is hard sometimes for agents is that, and managers is that they know we try. So when we actually say, no, we don't want to try, it, they don't want to hear the reason. And sometimes it's just the soul of the, per the person. Anybody, you know, if you're a good actor, you can most likely act something. But the beauty is when you don't see that happening at all. When it truly is the soul of the actor meets the soul of the character and there's very little in between that takes you out of what they're doing. That's, the, that's what you look for. That's the dream. Yeah. Um, and you had talked a little bit about the associate for Dead to Me, and you do, I mean, we know that you're double nominated this year. You have so many, you're known for so many shows, so many shows at once. Can you tell us a little bit about how your office works and like what happens when, you know, you've got a new project? Is it all hands on deck? Are there like, what can people kind of expect from a casting process? and? Yeah. Um, I think that everything that happens in our office, uh, um, you know, Sharon and I have really set up the company in a way that it's, it happens very authentically and organically. So in the beginning, Sharon and I, and this is like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we worked on everything together. Um, as the company was building, which was never intentional, we just wanted to work on really good projects. Um, you know, Russell, how long have you been with us? 10 years plus? 12, 15? 12? Yeah. So Russell came to us um, season two or one of Breaking Bad? Two. Two, two of Breaking Bad. Um, and Gohar had been with us prior and then the writer's strike kind of took her away for a little bit and then she came back. Um, so they were our associates at the time and then just started building and building with us. So as we began to build, there was sort of this organic process that happened where I would become the lead on a certain show and with a certain client and Sharon would become the lead point person on a certain show with a certain client. Um, and then from that, we would build the staff and some of it was just who was available. And then some of it was, you know, um, Russell's been doing Breaking Bad for so long. We're really kind of honing in on that comedy and he came from comedy. So he and I started to do a lot of the comedies together. At the same time, it was the three of us doing The Handmaid's Tale, which is not a comedy at all. But you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, it's just this level of trust that we all have with each other. I think that um, when people see pictures of us and our work family and they're like, is it really that great, all of you together? And it really, really is. We love each other. We have been through marriages and pregnancies and breakups and togetherness and, and buying homes. And I mean, we've all been together for such a long time. Um, and I think that even in this expansion, you know, Russell and, and Gohar have partnered together and, and gone out and got their own job under the Bialy Thomas umbrella. Um, so there's four casting directors in our office, myself, Sharon, obviously, Russell and Gohar. Um, and then we have very experienced high-level associates, um, Stacia Kimler, Alyssa Morris, and um, Katie Rampey is kind of um, a newer associate, but um, doing great work in that space. And then we've got, you know, fairly new assistants. Um, am I forgetting anybody, Russell? <laughs> it's been so long. It's been since March. I know. I miss everybody. It's crazy. But... Um, I kind of rambled on. I don't know if I really specifically <laughs> answered your question, but okay. um, I think, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, we give a lot of autonomy, um, very hands-on. Look, Sharon and I don't work on a project if we don't want to be on it. 
that's really the, 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 the bottom line. So if, if we're on it and there, we're, we're there, you know, not necessarily together, but it's one of us. Yeah. I think people sometimes see the name of a casting company or they're familiar with a team with what it was at the beginning. And then yeah. it obviously has grown. You've been working together for a long time. And I, yeah, I don't think everyone fully knows what to expect and they just think sure. it's going to be these two casting directors in a room and yeah okay. yeah I, and and look where we get um where Sharon and I really kind of get um protective if you will or irritated or upset is if an actor comes in and they have an attitude because they're in the room with Russell or Gohar or not one of us that's a problem they have to respect the process and that we know what we're doing they can be disappointed you know, but we all share information. There isn't a, any way that any casting director can know every single actor. So what we do, I think, Russell, is we strengthen the knowledge of actors across the board because we, we share so much information of, you know, who I might have seen or who I watched this movie and, you know, nobody else is watching kids stuff except for me right now with a, you know, eight and a 10 year old at home. <laughs> um, but, you know, and so I could share information with Russell on that where he is watching, you know, different kinds of, of shows and he goes out to the theater a lot and he goes to see concerts and can say, you know, oh my God, I saw this amazing singer and I really think that they could transition and we should try them as an actor. So it's just, it just strengthens, strengthens, I think, the, the, the world and it's around great us. We're all, like, we're all like in the same space usually. <laughs> and hopefully yeah. we can back to that um because you know you're sitting there and you know you're like hey you know so and so yeah yeah well and one of us is bound to know them yeah between the between uh, everyone in the office it's it's unusual that there's somebody that none of us knows <laughs> yeah well speaking of being in the same space and how we have not been um can you talk a little bit about how it has been since isolation have you been casting anything have things kind of paused i know things are sort of picking up again especially in the la area so could you talk a little bit about what that's been like well it depends on the show um we have a couple of shows that are you know um gearing up and really trying to go back at, before the end of 2020 um and it's all kind of touch and go based on the surge here in LA and in other places. One of them shoots in um, Atlanta, one of them shoots in Austin, one of them shoots in Canada. I think the one that will likely start is Canada. Would you agree, Russell? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and all of the shows that are shooting in LA, um, most of them um, have been pushed to 2021. Um, and you know, you're just kind of going, going with the flow on it, you know? Yeah. Have, so you haven't re really been doing a lot of like Zoom auditioning or anything like that? No, but it's no different than what we were doing before in a way, I feel like, Russell, don't you? Um, uh, largely, like we would, have, you know, we, because all of our shows, sh almost none of them shoot here. Um, yeah very few, um, we would do a lot of self-taping of people from across the country. So it's still like getting in self-tapes for, you know, Walking Dead and Better Call Saul and Handmaid's Tale and everything. Um, we have been um, working on um, a Netflix show um, called The Society and people have been sending in, uh, we've been watching a lot of self-taped auditions for the new season of that show. Um, and um, we haven't gotten to the stage yet where we start doing like Zoom callbacks and meetings. It's just kind of like regular process. We just, the people in LA are also now having to self tape instead of coming in. The yeah, room. I think that'll be the biggest change, honestly, is, is that callback test chemistry read um, moment will, will happen on Zoom potentially. But other than that, I feel like we're going to, it'll be very similar to what we have you know, been doing. Well, on that note, because you do have a, you do a lot of experience with self tapes, even before <laughs> all of this, people are, especially people who are used to auditioning in person are pretty desperate to know like the same style of do's and don'ts in an audition room. Like yeah. what, what are the things that come to mind 
for self tapes that are like, do the, these things. And if you do these things, I like will turn it off or just maybe not that intense, but yeah, I feel guilty. I feel like we all watch every single self tape that comes in, you know, people put their work into it. And so to not to ever watch it, it feels a little, um, just disrespectful to the actor in the process. But, um, for me, Russell, jump in if I'm missing anything. It's, you know, the, the basics you want to shoot from right about under your chest up and be framed in nicely. Um, you don't want the reader to overpower. If you can have a good reader, that's great. And they don't need to act. They can just kind of facilitate what you're doing. The worst it's is when the- Calm down. It's not their audition. <laughs> <laughs> calm down. Yes, and I think secretly, if they're using an actor friend, they're like, ooh, what if they hear my voice and they think I'm so great on the other end and then they're gonna call me. Just stop. Do your friend a favor, try to help them get the job and then focus on yours at another time. Uh, make sure the lighting is good, make sure you have a plain background. Um, I think even more so with self tapes, if you think that you are, you should always do one normal and then one throw it away and speed it up. Because what tends to happen with self tapes is there's nobody in the room to do that. And there are times where we're just watching them and we're like, oh my God, I can't, you know. So keep it moving, keep it moving. Um, am I forgetting anything, Russell? Um, no, I saw somebody said, do you need a ring light? And no, you don't. Um, you just need good lighting. It could be natural. Good lighting. Um, coming Are through. you watching the Q&A questions? You're so yeah. like tech savvy. <gasps> I'm not at well, all. I keep getting distracted. It's, it's hard because it, it's it's the, uh, the chat goes on and on. But if you do see anything that you want to answer that you catch, because I can't catch them all, then feel free to um, jump <laughs> in and answer them. But I know that there's a, a, been a lot of questions both for this session, but also throughout the months of like just people because it almost, if you're not as used to auditioning via self-tape and you're used to getting feedback in the room, there's this like, yeah. am I doing something that's glaringly wrong and I'm going to send this and I don't know yeah. if that's glaringly wrong. And then Look, and I think they have to watch it back. Watch it back from a different perspective. Don't watch it back from your ego. Watch it back from, are they going to watch the whole thing? Because sometimes, you know, and it's not out of disrespect or not having the time. Sometimes we do see, you know, 20, 30 seconds, and we really get a sense that they're not necessarily right for the part. Um, so try to just watch it back without any ego and make sure the reps are watching it too, because sometimes they have already had conversations with the casting directors um, who have maybe notes so far or if they're really paying attention and they saw the directions or the notes of the character in the instruction for the self tape. Um, and if they really haven't followed that, the rep should be jumping in as well and advising and guiding them. Um, there are also times where we watch a self tape and if we feel that there's something there, but they're missing, um, you know, a little nuance or a little moment, or if the quality isn't as good, but we want to send it on to the producers, we will take the time, go back to the reps, here are our notes, have them do it again, and then, you know, send it back to us. Um, so it isn't just uh, watching and, you know, it's a click or it's not a click. Oh my God. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just, back, sorry. You're okay? All right. I'm gonna mute you for just a um, just to, so some of the questions are coming in based on what Sherry said um, about the throwing, doing multiple takes and throwing it away. Uh, you shouldn't send in like three, four takes of a scene. Like, no, don't do that. What she's saying is just, you know, you get one that you like, um, send that one. And a lot of, but a lot of times when people are self-taping, the tendency is to do too much. So then just do another take. So there's two takes total where you're just very simple, very, um, uh, you feel like you're not doing anything. Um, Which is hard because yeah. don't forget, it's a close up. So we're seeing you like this. So if you're really acting, it's not, it, you know, no, it's how it should be in the room or, you know, as you're filming on set. 
Yeah, I think that's a it, kind of an important point to make is that ultimately most of the projects that you're casting or all of them pretty much are going to be on camera. So if it doesn't, if it's not translating for you on a cell yeah. phone, then it's not definitely not going to translate when it's on set on camera. Yeah. Um, and then you we're talking about how you kind of look globally. And as you saw earlier, there are people from outside of the United States on yeah. this call. There are questions, do you look at citizenship or visa status or anything when you're casting? Is that something that you have to consider? Yes, yes, very much so, very much so. Okay. And a lot of it is a timing issue uh, and an yeah. expense issue. Usually if it's a series regular role and there is time for the application process, then it's fine and the studio will get the actor a visa. But if it's just a guest star or a recurring role, there's not time and there's not budget for bringing in. Yeah. People. So we can't. And there are certain studios that won't even take... Um, you, you have to have a, a green card. They won't take a work visa if it's from another show. We get that question a lot. Um, it's the first question that we ask if um, we're investigating an actor from outside the US. Because we don't want to waste anybody's time. It's not fair. Yeah, and then along the same lines, there's been a few questions about accents, whether it's a regional US accent or an accent from a different country. And people are curious if it's always bad for them to have you know, an, a non-neutral American accent, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, or what has been deemed a neutral American accent. Does that make them, uh, out, does that put them outside of contention always? Or what's kind of, what's your experience with that? I think it's opened up a lot in the past few years um, to more um, be just because television has become more representative, especially in the streaming and cable space. Um, um, you don't necessarily have to do an American accent unless the character is specifically and for story reasons must be American, which mm -hmm. happens. But um, uh, there's definitely more opportunities, um, I would say, in the past few years than there used to be. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I guess, would you recommend, for people who don't, who, you know, especially people who are from outside the United States, would you recommend working on, like... An American accent, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it just, uh, you know, there are roles that, you know, are written and do have to be American for whatever story reason. Um, so it just, you're just going to have more opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and there's a lot of questions also, we have a lot of newer actors or people who are trying to get into it. And there's a lot of questions about representation. And so kind of... A, broadly do you consider people when you're casting a show especially maybe when you're not in a time crunch do you look outside of people who have representation yeah yeah i think so i mean one of the most exciting things for us is to find somebody that you know is truly and i use this loosely quote unquote a discovery because somebody somewhere has already discovered them. It's not just, unless you're walking down the street and you poke somebody on their back and say, hey, you look amazing. Would you like to audition for this part? And then they get it, that's a discovery. Um, but um, that, and that rarely happens anymore. But yes, I, 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 there isn't, we're not turned off by the fact that they don't have um, representation. It really is about the work. That is all it ever should be about. And I think if, uh, if you're starting out in this industry, um, if you really focus on the work, the rest of it will will really truly come into play. If it's meant to be, then it's going to happen. I'm not saying don't get out there and try to hustle and do what you can do, but if you are not getting any work, you are not getting representation, then you go out and you find a play and you do a play. Um, work begets work. Brian Cranston, in one of his very famous um, interviews, where an, I, I believe an actor was asking him about, you know, 
getting to the point where he got to. And he said, I wanted to be an actor and I started acting. That was it. I didn't focus on headshots. I didn't focus on a manager. I didn't focus on an, you know, an agent. I wanted to be an actor. I, I was an actor every day. He would go to, you know, a fast food restaurant and he would create a character as he was ordering his food. So I kind of believe that same philosophy. If you are truly about wanting to be an actor and it's not about becoming famous or being on TV, if it's, if it's that passion that burns inside you, that's an artist. And then that's what you have to do. Yeah. And if you're, if you are looking to cast people and you, you are looking outside of your, the agents that you go to, you're mm -hmm. looking for some kind of work that proves that they can do it. So I think yeah. people concern that they don't have a professional credit or they don't have, mm -hmm. you know, several minutes of different things to put on a reel, but if they can do something that can show that they can handle the role, you'll, that is what. Yeah. I mean, it also comes from different places. Like, um, you know, there was a role that we were going to be casting um, on Barry and I listened to a lot of podcasts. And so there was a, a host of one of the podcasts that I really just kind of, I loved her voice. Um, I loved her intellect. I loved what she had to say. So if I could get her in the room and, and have her be just who she is with the lines that are, you know, scripted, um, I felt like that could be really interesting and really cool. So those are the kinds of things we're doing too. It's, it's, um, and that's not to defeat actors. I don't mean to, to, to say that, but, um, it wasn't like somebody was submitting her and pitching her. It was just a thought and an idea that I had had from listening to this woman host her podcast. Um, and there was somebody, Russell, that we met on Dead to Me early on that we, it, it, it was out of like a college interview. She was a panelist or something in, um, at a school. Um, it was on an LGBTQ um, platform. I can't remember, but anyway, we tracked her down. She came in, she read, she was fantastic. Happened to be an actress who had, you know, moved to LA, who we didn't know who she was and she had representation. And so, you know, we're digging. And if, and if you're right, and if it feels right in the research that we can do now, you know, on, on the internet, we'll find you. That doesn't mean to stop doing the work, keep doing the work. But you also have to do something to be found. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's the way you get found. Like, you're not, uh, I mean, I feel like people, you know, will try to tweet at us or whatever and be like, I'm an actor. How do I get started? You act. Mm -hmm. it is, you have, it's really you, simple. You do short films, you do whatever, you theater, right. you do whatever. Yeah. And that's how, that's how you're going to, um, that's how you're going to get found. It's not going to be from, you know, not acting. <laughs> yeah. Is that clear, everybody? You got to <laughs> act. <laughs> and for the people who do, so there was an interesting question about for people who do have representation, if you're, if you go, go to agents and you're looking to cast a role and you send the breakdown to two different agents, and someone asked if you're, if you have a better or like a closer working relationship with one agent, does that give the actor an advantage or is that not a factor? Is that not even, is that not something that really comes up? Sorry, I was reading. I missed the question. <laughs> Well, so I was curious, it, do, you have, do you have closer working relationships with certain agents that give the actors a leg up? Or is it, you know, if you're trying to fill a role, you're really just looking for actors that could fit? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, we do try to go through um, everything that comes in. Um, but there are definitely, uh, after working so long with people, you, you definitely establish and figure out that there are agents or managers who represent actors that you um, know are going to be good and Yeah, you trust them. You have a shorthand with them. Okay. And they get really pissed at us when they're pushing and pushing somebody and we just say, no, they're not right. No, I'm not going to see them for the 20th time. 
no. And they get really mad at us, but whatever. It's, 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 we want the best actor for the part. That's the bottom line. Because if it's not, we're, we wouldn't be sitting here, honestly. Yeah. And kind of the last thing in this, in this realm is there, someone was curious if you uh, are looking for a specific type of training. Like, does it, does it make it so that someone is not going to get considered if they don't have a certain type of training or does someone, do you flag if someone has a certain type of training? Well, yeah. I mean, if somebody's from Massachusetts on the resume and I look at it, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, that's my home, you know, it's my home state. So no, <laughs> I think that it's, um, for me personally, Russell can speak for himself. Um, it's uh, again about the work. I, I think that training has to happen. Um, but training isn't, isn't for one, what it is for somebody else. You know, it's about working the muscle and figuring it out. And I want who's best for the part. Yeah, I think it's about demonstrating um, that you're serious about being an actor and about doing the work. And you didn't just wake up this morning and say, oh, I'm pretty, I'm an actor. Like, you yeah, have, I want there's to a place that. for that. It's called reality TV. Yeah. And I'm not dissing it because I, you know, it has become a friend to me over this quarantine. <laughs> but it's not a place for the work that we want to do, the aesthetic we have and the kind of actors that we want to hire. Okay, and there's, yeah, there's not just, there's not an expectation for, if someone wants to work in TV, they have to, they have to have done this. It's whatever no. you them as a performer. No, I don't think so, yeah. Okay, and um, an interesting question, because I think a lot of people uh, think that once you cast someone, your job is done once you, you know, you have the scheduling all figured out, the contracts. But someone was curious what happens, um, what your expectations are once you cast an actor. Show up and do your job. <laughs> okay. Um, I, those are the expectations. Don't go out and like, you know, if you came in with a beard and long hair, please don't go out and shave it off and show up to set. Um, and we've gotten very specific in our communication about things like that, but at the end of the day, um, just go in and do your job because if we hear otherwise, then, you know, it, it, it doesn't put you in a good light for, for, for getting to that place. Be nice and on time and professional on set because if you're not, then we will not want to cast you again because we will hear about it. Do your job. <laughs> yeah. It sounds simple, but I guess sometimes it's not always as simple as it sounds or people don't. Maybe. Yeah, and I think in, in all seriousness, people could get nervous. It could be a first job and they show up to set and they are, you know, we, we all get nervous. I get nervous when I go and, and meet for a job that I really want. Of course, that's going to happen. I get nervous for a first producer session. If there's a producer in the room with the director, like I want them to think that I'm doing a good job. Um, I get that. But if it's about the work, then you're going to be okay. Don't try to steal a scene from Elizabeth Moss because that's not going to happen. <laughs> Just facilitate whatever Elizabeth Moss is doing and you will rise to the occasion, you know? Um, yes. Um, understood. Even though I will not be doing that, I understand. Um, <laughs> I don't, there was no chance that I will be sharing a screen with Elizabeth Moss anytime soon and I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> And on the flip side of things, we do get some questions. We have some questions about what people should do if they're interested in getting into casting. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, that's a really good one. There are a lot of ways now. Um, we, the CSA has a really great training program that Gohar um, from our office, Gohar Gazazian from our office has really been a part of um, implementing and um, putting together, quite frankly, creating the whole thing with um, a committee from the CSA, um, which we're all members of. And it's, is it, I think it's two or three days and it's intensive and you start at the basics. You start at, you know, what, what is, how do you call out an audition? I mean, it's just um, really very detailed for somebody who has never done it before. Um, <clears throat> I think you have to have an expectation that's really hard work, that it isn't what we said. 
um, when you start out um, as an assistant, you are an assistant. And we are an office that we always are sharing ideas and, and welcome ideas. Um, but it's kind of the same as an actor who's starting out. Don't go and try to steal the scene. We see you do your job and you will progress, you know, in a way that, that you want to, um, because we're here to try to make the next generation of casting directors. And I think that we have a really good training program sort of in BLA Thomas, like, and, and I say that unofficially, but we have systems in place and we really care about the people that we're bringing into our family. Um, watch movies, watch TV, have a point of view, um, and try to work in the offices with the, with the shows and the content that you're most interested in, because that helps. If you really love um, the CW space, then try to get in with one of those casting directors. If you really love, you know, the more indie raw cable stuff, then try to get in with those casting directors. Okay. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think, um, do you, would you recommend, I've, I've talked to some casting directors that say, even if you're not trying to go into casting as an actor, it's really helpful to work in some capacity in a casting office. Have you ever had experience with that? Do you have readers? Like, what do you feel about that advice? You want to take that one, Russell? <laughs> no. Um, we do occasionally have readers, but mostly not. Um, it's usually one of the casting directors and our associate or an assistant in the room. Um, uh, we do occasionally use readers um, if it's super busy and um, whatever. Um, I think it's valuable um, if you are able to work in a casting office, only in the sense that it kind of gives you a better idea of um, how, what the process is and how a lot of times, um, you know, as an actor, you can go in and do, all you can do is go in and audition and do your best work. And then there are so many other factors that are out of your control that you can't yeah. do anything about. And I think being in, the, in a casting office and, and uh, kind of seeing that should, and also like make you feel like, the casting director is rooting for you because we are. Mm -hmm. We want everyone. It demystifies to... it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I want to. I want to take the last couple of minutes before we wrap up here um, to sort of do. I have a couple of like more reflective questions about your work. Um, when you think about a casting search, is there like a, a time? I'm just trying to get an. If there's to see if there's an example here of a time when while you're on the search there has been someone who jumped out at you so much whether it's because you saw something they did on the internet or in an audition or a self-tape that you were immediately even if they weren't right for the role that they that you knew you were going to remember them and try to like fit them into something you don't have to give names but if there's all the time you did all the time I mean, our job is cultivating relationships with actors, honestly. And so these actors that, you know, have been coming in and I mean, we've, sometimes we all look at each other like, I can't believe they're coming in again for us because they've never booked. And then they book. And it's about the meeting of the right role at the right time. So um, if we keep having you back, it's for a reason. It, it means that there's something there and we just really want to explore that. And I think actors feel that when they come in for us. Um, if, they, if they've, you know, if they're experienced, they've been coming in time and time and time again, but um, it happens all the time, all the time. I mean, Gail Rankin, I have been following for years and I was obsessed with her, couldn't wait to cast her. And when this role came up in Perry Mason um, of Emily, I don't know if anybody has seen it. Um, I, she was in my head, I read the script and I was like, that is it. That is who I'm going to cast. I, like, kill me now. And there are a lot of people that love that role. Because obviously, if you've seen the show, you know why. Um, and I snuck around and I called the agents and I said, look, I do not want a blast going out that I'm starting to see this role because I'm not. Send this material to Gail. Have her put herself on tape. I'm starting here. If I can make this happen, I'm making it happen. And it's a strategy. You know, I just knew this, is, this was the perfect piece. And 
it all came together. And I mean, within, you know, the self tape came in after I had spoken with her, she put herself on tape, it came in, I sent it to everybody. And they, um, they said, who else is there? And Sherry said, nobody. Nope. They, uh, they were like, and I did it perfect. I sent all of her theater, you know, materials and gave her the, gave the background and kept it really clear, but also left the opening that it was their decision. And everybody just started chiming in and said, we're done. Oh my God, I can't believe this. And I was weeping, was weeping. And so that's the relationship that we have established over this, you know, five years with, with Gail. And, and, you know, the other example is the one we always talk about, Russell on Better Call Saul. With Ray. Oh my God, I love Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I well, just to pass in front of everybody and I love you. <laughs> um, is, is there a, a, a moment that you watched a project that you cast that you kind of we're really proud of your work when you saw it, you know, all in its finish. Obviously, I'm expecting this probably happens for a lot of things, but do you, is there like a moment that sticks out to you from a project you've worked on that you're like, oh, like that came together so well. I'm like, this is really exciting. Um, I think it's easier for us to talk about when they don't. <laughs> yeah. And that's always in private when we're having coffee or a cocktail. Coffee in the morning, cocktail at the end of the day, or like midday. What time is it? <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> well, it's almost five in New York. Um, right, and what time is it in London? They're already drinking at a pub. <laughs> and the last- Love it. I, can you think of any projects that you would consider very well cast that you didn't cast yourself? Anything that stands The Wire. Up? The Wire. Um, I love Better Things. I think that show is so good. The children yes. on that show were so good. Um, yeah. Amazing cast. Um, yeah. Um, There's a lot out there these days. There's a lot. a lot. I think The Wire is fantastic. Um, and, and I mean, and that's, that goes way back. Uh, Succession, I think, is flawless. Um, and they're up against us for Handmaid's Tale, so they're going to take it, and it's all good. We're happy with that. <laughs> Um, right? Yeah, fine. When it's meant to be, it'll be. We don't do the shows to get Emmys, honestly. So, I mean, we've we've been nominated for seven and have lost all of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I just want to go back to something really quick. I I just think that there's no one way for a person to get to where they're going. I mean, I am from Massachusetts and I did not go to college and I always loved TV. I watched it so much when I was a kid. I used to get yelled at, get away from the TV. Um, and I didn't realize what I was doing at the time when I would watch nine to five, four times in a day that I just was, I, I just loved watching the scenes and the work. Um, and I didn't realize that. I thought I just loved the movie and wanted to watch it again and loved Dolly Parton's nails. Um, but, you know, I didn't go to college. I decided I was going to move to LA when I was 22 with 150 bucks and I did. And I packed my car and I left. And I didn't know anybody and I didn't know what I was. I was a manager at The Gap and I was like, oh, I'll just use my two weeks vacation, travel cross country and I'll get there and I'll have a job, which is great. And I slept on a floor for a year of somebody's apartment that I had met. And, you know, it all just comes together. And I started interning in a casting office, not even casting, um, for casting purposes. I was volunteering for a, um, a pediatric AIDS um, foundation. And I just was in there and I was like, oh, I get what's happening here. Because I thought my whole childhood was performing. I thought I was going to be an actor. And then I understood the energy of the casting office. and and it was a little bit more um, tangible. And then I got my first job as a location casting assistant on the movie Contact. And I approached it um, with just like, like a sponge. Like I just wanted to learn when I was interning in the office that somebody said, can you go get the sides? And it was right after lunch. And I literally went and I was like, what are they? Okay, they're coleslaw, they're french fries. I don't understand. It was lunchtime. I'm like, I'm going to bring the sides into the casting director. And then an actor came in and I just read the room and he was like, hey, do you have the sides for Bob? And I was like, and I just looked, you have to just take in your surroundings. And I just was such a doer, not a, you know, 
And I was like, oh yes. And I saw a file, it said Bob, and I, you just put two and two together. So then I brought the sides into the casting director, not the coleslaw, the sides for Kevin. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, and then it all just, I just wanted to learn and I was a worker. And you know, I had three jobs when I was in LA. I was a casting assistant, I worked at a bar and I worked in retail. So um, you, you just, you make it happen, you know? Um, there's not one way for everybody to get there. Yeah, I think and it's- And here I am. Somebody yeah. wrote, you're a queen. I think they're talking about you and not me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people, people mm. that story. It's, um, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's the same with acting. You can't try to put yourself into a box where you feel. And look, we all go through the, I should be here by this time. I should be here by this time. And it's just not the case, you know? So um, just, just work hard in what you want to do. Well, I think that's a good place to end, a very inspiring place to end. Thank you both so much for giving so much time and experience and advice to all of these actors that are at various stages of getting their careers off the ground. Congratulations on your two nominations. Thank you. Um, Thank really you. Spreading it around to, uh, to boost the odds. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, but it's just a testament to your great work. And thank you for doing that great work, giving us a lot of great TV to watch. And um, thank you. we will keep watching. And thank you again. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, I hope everyone stays healthy. Thank, thank you very time. much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, you. Bye. Bye, Russell. Love you. Bye. <laughs>